Hello, and welcome to today's webinar presented by 451, Database as a Service, What Should You Consider Before Migrating to the Cloud? Presented by Matt Aslett, Research Director for Data Platforms and Analytics at 451 Research. First, to begin, I'd like to go over just some quick housekeeping on how to submit your questions and some follow-up information. To submit your questions, simply click on the question button in the webinar interface and type in your question. We will try to get to as many questions as time allows, but if we can't get to your question, uh, we will be sure to follow up after the webinar. A copy of the slides will be sent to all attendees after the webinar is completed today. So with that, I will hand it over to Matt Aslett, who can kick it off for us. Matt? Uh, thanks, Rosanna, and thank you, everybody, for, for joining us on today's webinar. So just before we get into the, uh, the details itself, just want to give you a brief introduction to 451 Research for anybody who's not uh, come across the organization before. So we are uh, uh, an IT research and advisory company uh, founded in 2000. Uh, we have over 250 employees, which includes over 100 analysts, and over 1,000 clients um, in areas such as technology and service providers, corporate advisory, finance, professional services and of course IT decision makers um, and the, the next or the last uh, number I'll read out from from this chart but the most important one perhaps is the next one 50,000 plus that's IT professionals business users and consumers that are in our research community so these are not necessarily uh, you know paying customers of 451 research but what they are they're practitioners people out there in the field using technology in their day-to-day -day jobs and they uh, work with us in terms of completing uh, interviews and surveys and increasingly shape our perspective on the world and in return for doing so uh, they receive access to our research so an increasingly important part of 451 research and, uh, and you'll get a few uh, points in the, in the uh, webinar today uh, that have been generated from that uh, research community in terms of uh, how our research is delivered so we deliver a combination of, of written research and data across 15 channels uh, we talk about from the data center core to the mobile edge, so right from data center technologies, mobile uh, multi-tenant data centers, right up to enterprise mobility and mobile telecoms. And the area that I cover, data platforms and analytics, is you see about in the center of that slide. But so we cover, you know, the the breadth and depth of the uh, of the IT industry. So on to the core um, subject of the presentation itself today, and we're talking about database as a service. Uh, talking about some of the, the, the use cases and adoption patterns. Um, a lot of what I'm talking about in, in this presentation is actually based on a report that we published earlier this year um, on that, that very subject. And as you can see here, the, that report was, was commissioned by Oracle, although you know put together uh, based on our independent analysis, and, and it is available from them. Um, and, and obviously the link is available there, but you'll get a copy of these slides and you'll be able to, to click through to, to that. Uh, but in terms of what I'll be talking about today, obviously start off with a kind of a summary of our, our key findings and talk about sort of defining databases as a service, databases as a service adoption trends, phases of cloud database adoption, uh, some of the drivers and challenges that we've identified in relation to databases as a service adoption, uh, a little bit specifically about cloud economics, uh, and then hybrid database services. And we'll wrap up looking at some use case examples, some of the companies that we spoke to in relation to putting together that report um, and some of the sort of learnings that, uh, you know, the, the, the key things that we learned from them. And then we'll wrap that up, obviously, with some conclusions. So if you look at sort of a, a, at a high level, the, the summary of the, the findings from putting this report together, and you know, this, is, this is something that, that we've been looking at on an ongoing basis, obviously, for, from, for many years. And we, we do see that databases as a service offers multiple potential benefits to, to end users. Um, though the three main areas that we've identified are faster time to application development, reduced administration overheads, and lower database licensing and infrastructure costs. Um, of course, we see that the, the most likely benefits of the, uh, sorry, the most likely uh, um, people to benefit from those advantages are 
database administrators and data architects, so people who are working you know, with databases on a day-to-day -day basis. However, we do see that senior decision makers and business users um, also stand to gain from on-demand access to database services. And as we'll see when we look at some of the examples, you know, the company as a whole definitely stands to benefit from some of those advantages um, that, that we've identified. Um, in terms of the, the sort of level of database as a service uh, adoption, I mean, certainly when we look at it compared with other cloud services, um, it could be described as uh, still a, definitely in the early stages. We see a lot of organizations are, ent uh, are exploiting their existing investments in their on-premises database deployments. Um, but they're doing so while identifying the most appropriate workloads for either transition to databases as a service or actually you know, migrating to databases as a service. And, and at this stage, we see a lot of adoption of databases as a service is, is driven by development and test workloads. And, and we anticipate that you know, the more of that we see, you know, there will be a snowball effect and we'll see more and more database workloads moving to uh, databases as a service over time. Now, just to be absolutely clear about what we mean when we talk about databases as a service, obviously it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a phrase that's, uh, that's well used, but just to be absolutely clear about that, you know, we see databases as a service, uh, it can be described as the on-demand delivery of database management software. So it's consumed by the end users as a service without the need to first install any hardware or software. Um, you know, typically when people talk about databases as a service, you know, they're often talking about public cloud, uh, database services, and we do see clearly, you know, there's a lot of services available from the public cloud providers as well as the incumbent database software providers as well, uh, you know, thanks to their moves into uh, public cloud uh, infrastructure as a service and, and platforms as a service. However, you know, when we're talking about the, especially when we're talking about the general benefits of databases as a service, you know, we also include private cloud databases as a service within that. So within a private cloud database as a service, we see that IT, you know, the IT department, whoever is responsible for running, you know, the database, uh, databases within any individual organization, maintains that responsibility for managing and configuring the database software. However, it's delivered to the end users, you know, as a service, as we've, as we've said, so consumed on demand rather than being configured and installed in response to a specific requirement, which is, you know, in, in often cases re results in, a, in an element of time lag in terms of uh, getting the, the database uh, configured and deployed. And, you know, that's where we see a lot of the agility advantages coming from databases as a service. So looking at the adoption trends, and I touched all this on this already. I mean, we certainly clearly we look at public cloud uh, adoption in in general. Uh, it's in, it's widespread and it's increasing. And, and and also what we see is that you know big data has an element of of uh, of something to play here as well, in that it's driving that general trend is driving organisations to look for new approaches to generate insight from data that was perhaps previously ignored. And so we definitely see sort of increased willingness from, from organizations to look to alternatives uh, either to, you know, their existing database software or just to different ways to consume uh, database software and services. Um, you know, uh, as we see that obviously cloud services provide an alternative to on-premises infrastructure for storage and processing of data sets, you know, big and small. Um, and that they can lower the barriers to adoption, enabling enterprises to reduce the cost and time involved in configuring new data uh, processing and analytics platforms. Um, and so especially when we see, uh, you know, organizations that are involved with new projects, as I said, especially when it's involving new data sets that perhaps haven't been stored and processed as part of their regular on-premises infrastructure, those are prime uh, examples of opportunities to adopt uh, you know, database as a service. Um, as we said, though, you know, clearly cloud database is still in the very early stages of adoption. Um, and, and, you know, the vast majority of the existing data-related workloads are clearly deployed on-premise. On as we said, Dev and Test is definitely a, an early driver for database as a service adoption. Um, you can get a sense of um, the, the trends we see here and, and 
um, it, it might be worth putting the, uh, the, the screen in, in full screen mode just to see uh, some of the details on this. But um, this is some data from our Voice of the Enterprise Cloud Computing Survey. Uh, which was conducted in the second quarter of 2015, and this is a prime example of the sort of uh, you know work that we're doing with that uh, that group of 50,000 uh, plus users that I talked about earlier. Clearly, not all of them <laughs> answering every question, but um, it was several hundred, um, close to a thousand involved in this particular survey. And what we found was that just 4.4% of respondents are using software as a service. Um, as the primary deployment method for operational and analytic database workloads today, um, versus 2.9% uh, deploying databases on infrastructure as a service. And by comparison, as you can see here, over 58% are deploying operational and analytic database workloads on premises in non cloud environments, um, and uh, around about 17% are using on premises private cloud. So, you know. Just evidence for what we're talking about that the vast majority of deployments today are clearly you know on premises in non cloud environments, however, the results do indicate growing adoption of cloud for operational and analytic databases um, so asked what uh, deployment options the users expected to be uh, taking advantage of two years from now, we saw that eight point five percent of respondents expected to be using databases as a service uh, for operational and analytic databases. Uh, sorry, the software as a service for operational and analytic databases up from 4.4% today. Uh, while databases deployed on infrastructure as a service is expected to grow from 2.9% up to 8% uh, in two years' time. So the use of on premises non cloud environments is expected to decline. Clearly, it's going to remain, you know, the, the, the majority is still we're looking here at 39% amongst this group of respondents uh, compared to 58% uh, in 2015. Um, and we expect on-premises private cloud usage will grow from, from about 17% to 22.5%. So we are seeing, you know, even though, as I said, it's early stages, clearly there is growth there, and there's an increased um, uh, expectations among enterprises that they will be looking at databases uh, running in the cloud, uh, be it either on private cloud or on infrastructure as a service or consumed as software as a service. Um, the early stage of database adoption uh, or database as a service adoption is also reflected in our market sizing estimates. Um, these are provided by 451 Research's Market Monitor uh, product. Um, as you can see here, so we've got um, sort of traditional on premises uh, operational databases uh, in orange, and we've got the sort of database as a service operational database uh, revenue. In blue, so obviously our orange making up the vast bulk of the revenue today, and continuing to do so even as we look to to 2020. But we do expect um, databases as a service revenue to to rapidly outpace on-premises database revenue in the years to come. So we're, we're anticipating 48% compound annual growth rate for operational databases as a service uh, between 2015 and 2020, compared to just 13% growth for on-premises operational database revenue. You know that said, you know database as a service revenue will still represent less than 20% of total operational database revenue by 2020. Um, but uh, you know, as, as we said, I think you know some of the devil is in the detail here because we're seeing you know much of that, well, you know, it, the revenue that's coming, uh, you know, from database operational databases as a service in the next five years will be from new projects, and we anticipate that a lot of that uh, existing orange revenue, if you like. You know, will be coming from the, you know the existing installed base, and that's you know not going away anytime soon. You know, most organisations they don't shut down their databases unless there's very good reason to do so, and they've gone through a significant transformational change to address to to adopt databases as a service. So it you know it's going to be a fairly slow pace, but clearly you know the, the growth, a significant growth is there in terms of databases as a service adoption. Um, that brings us on to the, you know, the next subject. We talk about phases of cloud database uh, adoption and the different pace of growth for, for different 
database workloads and application workloads. And, and one of the things you know, we see is that you know, clearly not all database workloads are created equally. So some are more mission critical than others. Some have re regulatory implications. And those are, are some of the significant challenges to databases as a service adoption, as, as we'll come on to see. You know, we do see there are definitely examples of companies that are deploying mission critical production database workloads to the cloud. So they are out there, absolutely. What they tend to be is companies that have gone all in on cloud. They've been through a big transformational process, as, I, as I've said, that, that means that they're adopting cloud across the board. And so clearly those database workloads have, have gone with them. Um, in for other organizations that are just looking at cloud and experimenting with cloud for database workloads, it's, it's much more driven by you know, what we call transient workloads today. Things like development and test and backup and recovery, you know, very much testing the waters, finding out, proving the, you know, the potential benefits from themselves, and then looking to move forward uh, with greater levels of adoption, um, obviously, uh, as and when they, they prove the, uh, the value to themselves. So just to, to sort of illustrate that in terms of the, the stages we see for, for cloud database adoption, of course, you know, the vast majority, as we said, of database workloads are on-premises today, but there is a path towards, uh, towards all-in cloud uh, levels of adoption. Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry, I knew I was going to cough my way through this. I apologize in advance for any further uh, coughing. So, you know, some of the phases we see, we see organizations looking at, you know, initially discovery and evaluation, trying to figure out, you know, what cloud database services are out there, both public and private, you know, which ones uh, make sense for them and which ones, uh, you know, that they have other organizational um, initiatives to, to adopt uh, in terms of the, the overall cloud uh, services, uh, you know, beyond databases as a service. Then we see organizations running trials and pilot projects, doing application test and development, and then obviously initial adoption with a few key workloads, and, and over time, you know, into a broad impl implementation, which takes them potentially, uh, you know, towards that all-in cloud position. And, you know, the interesting thing, you know, we hear a lot of talk about hybrid cloud, and I was at an event recently, and I, somebody was talking about, you know, hybrid cloud is not a trend, it's just, it's the reality, and and I think this is, you know, reflected here in, in these phases of adoption. You know, clearly for the most organisations as they pass through these phases, hybrid cloud, as particularly hybrid database uh, services, are going to be, uh, you know, it, it's just going to be the reality. There there are a few organisations that have gone all in cloud at this stage, whilst a lot of organisations are working towards that. The path to that is absolutely going to be hybrid. So what are the steps organizations can take and you know what are the drivers that we see that are helping organizations you know take that path uh, from from on premises uh, to cloud adoption for, for databases as a service um, amongst the most significant um, you know drivers we see uh, the first is is uh, cost avoidance and we see that incre enterprises are increasingly interested in, in public cloud database uh, and analytics services in particular as a potential means for avoiding on-premises uh, costs, although there are obviously, even with private cloud, there's some potential cost savings in terms of, you know, delivering as a service rather than configuring, uh, you know, to in, in require, in, sorry, in response to a, each individual requirement. Um, you know, but certainly if we look at, you know, public cloud, there's that avoidance of on-premises costs, primarily server and other infrastructure costs, but also potentially database software licensing. Um, we also see flexibility uh, as a key driver. Um, that includes, the, you know, the freedom from reliance on existing hardware suppliers, services suppliers, even software suppliers, and the ability to configure cloud resources as required for new developments, uh, as well as the ability to scale resources exact, uh, elastically to meet demand, which means, of course, scaling both up and down. Um, IT rejuvenation, I mentioned, uh, you know, sort of the importance perhaps of, of other ongoing larger transformational or, or business change uh, projects. And IT rejuvenation is definitely a key driver to databases of service adoption. So, um, you know, we see in many cases in, in organizations, cloud adoption today goes hand in hand with shadow IT. And, and, an, and a level of agility that's, that's kind of unfortunately lacking in most IT departments. Um, so database as a service we've seen increasingly is perceived as an opportunity from within, 
you know, those, some of those IT departments, certainly those that are, are, th are more forward thinking, as an opportunity to rejuvenate the profile of IT in the eyes of the business by delivering some of that flexibility and cost savings that the business is looking for whilst you know, maintaining perhaps, you know, the benefits of governance and responsibility that comes from uh, you know, the IT organization being, uh, having a, a handle on where the data, data resides and who has access to it and all those uh, other advantages. Transformational change, uh, you know, I've mentioned already, and you know, this is definitely significant. I mean, obviously, database as a service adoption doesn't occur in isolation. And, and what we see is transformational change enabled by infrastructure as a service and platform as a service adoption is a major driver uh, behind database as a service. You know, clearly there are database-specific choices to be made uh, along, you know, along this path. But if the, you're an organization that already has a cloud-first mandate for infrastructure and platform, and it stands to reason that the journey to database as a service is, is absolutely going to be accelerated. And finally, uh, we, we talk about data gravity. So uh, data gravity... Um, you know, reflects the fact that an increasing volume of data resides in the cloud and originates in the cloud, and the economic arguments for processing and analyzing that data in the cloud are really hard to ignore as that volume of data grows. So with large volumes of data being produced by things like click streams and device sensors, <coughs> excuse me, cloud storage is absolutely the most economically viable choice, and that increases the potential for associated database uh, and analytics workloads in the cloud. Now, in addition to looking at, sort of, you know, obviously the drivers for database as a service, we also looked at some of the, the primary barriers. And I should say that these as well, although you know, not necessarily represented in sort of uh, numerical data-driven format, a lot of the, what we're talking about here is driven by, again, by the, the work we do uh, with, you know, some of those 50,000 plus IT users in our, in our, research, in our research community and our ongoing conversations with them. Um, and have any conversation with anyone, it seems, about uh, cloud adoption, uh, any IT decision makers, and almost immediately uh, the focus uh, turns to, to security, both perceived and real security issues related to the cloud. And this is clearly a, a sensitive topic, especially for data-driven workloads, where data privacy and data locality issues need to be taken into account. Um, one thing we have seen, uh, we've observed, is a growing acceptance from many enterprises that actually, you know, the major cloud providers are probably actually, you know, as secure, if not more secure than, than their own, you know, data centers. Um, uh, but the security concerns certainly remain a barrier to adoption, and, and absolutely we would encourage, and, you know, we, we've seen a lot of organizations performing security reviews as a first step towards thinking about which workloads they might move into the cloud. Liability is uh, another issue which actually doesn't get as much attention, but it's closely related uh, you know, to, to security as a barrier to adoption, which is, well, if things do go wrong, who's, who's actually responsible for that? And what will the compensation be? And how will that be handled? And we're talking about, particularly, well, large and small enterprises, they're used to dealing with fine print contracts from their hardware and their software suppliers um, that covers all this in you know minute detail and and we've seen that they can struggle to get that same level of sort of promise from their cloud suppliers as their level of liability um, you know that that is changing and improving but it's certainly something that we see that a lot of organizations really you know it's, it's significantly top of mind for them it's just it may be an insurance premium but it's something they want to make sure they've got sorted out before they make any significant uh, level of adoption, especially when it comes to, you know, workloads that are the mission critical and 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 involve uh, potentially, uh, you know, potentially involve, um, you know, data-driven workloads. Again, um, performance is clearly is potentially an issue with with any cloud workload, but we see this obviously is, is specifically uh, relevant to uh, data-driven workloads, um, and and the issue is 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 really not where you know our performance whether performance you know issues might occur it's really what will how again how will the cloud provider respond if they do um and you know certainly we've seen organizations particularly when it comes to their you know more mission critical low latency workload they can be very you know reticent about moving those into a cloud environment until they've got answers uh, to those questions 
uh, you know, even for those that are organizations that are just experimenting and, you know, just really, you know, doing development tests and figuring out how they could potentially use the cloud, you know, performance tests definitely need to be carried out on a workload by workload basis to identify which of those applications are, you know, suitable for ongoing deployment uh, in, in that cloud environment. Uh, cost um, is another significant potential barrier, and we, we obviously we listed cost avoidance as a, as a potential benefit uh, for cloud adoption. So more to the point uh, in relation to a potential barrier is the issue of the, the clarity about cost. Um, you know, we see a lot of potential confusion out there amongst users about how to compare the cost of services, excuse me, services on different cloud platforms, and a lack of clarity. Especially about whether enterprises will bring will enable sorry whether enterprises will be allowed and enabled to bring existing licenses to that cloud environment. Um, additionally, in relation to the costs, uh, sunk costs. I mean, we talked about the existing investments in database software on premises. There's clearly existing investments on related infrastructure and data center uh, equipment, and all of that you know means that uh, you know it can be a significant barrier to change for organizations. Um, until you know, perhaps a later point in the life cycle of their existing on-premises workloads. Uh, finally, um, there's good old uh, people and process change, and and this, um, you know, obviously if we're talking about database services. It's natural we talk about te technology drivers and barriers, but um, you know, any anything cloud-related, um, people and process change is a significant. Bar potential barrier to, to adoption, uh, and that's e equally true of, of databases as a service. Um, we've seen some examples, for example, where um, you know just the entire structure of the organisation was based on sort of traditional sort of waterfall development methods, and and just was ill suited to the level of agility that they they might now be able to take advantage of um, in terms of adopting databases as a service. Um, you know, clearly, as we said, transformational change can be a driver, but the scale of transformational change, you know, clearly can become daunting to individuals and, and organizations alike. And in particular, in relation to, to database uh, workloads, um, you know, there, there is some potential, and we've seen some examples of, of sort of database hugging by DBAs, um, you know, uh, you know, potentially sort of fearing that their, you know, their 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 work and their and their role was under threat by uh, moving to databases as a service. So that you know, all of these things have to be taken into account um, when when considering the potential advantages of shared database services. Um, since uh, cost appeared on both, you know, the you know the the drivers and and challenges, I thought it's worth uh, zeroing in a little bit on on the cost economics. Um, uh, and the economic case for database and analytics in the cloud in, in greater detail. Um, certainly, we see that you know there there are potential cost savings from migrating to the public cloud, uh, absolutely. But those you know they're not guaranteed, and it really depends on the, the nature of the workload. So if workloads are sporadic, then an on-premises implementation is likely to be underutilized uh, much of the time, um, and um, uh, and that makes you know, potentially makes public cloud uh, the the better option. Um, however, uh, you know what we also see is that if data processing workloads are more frequent, a public cloud implementation is likely to gain from the theoretical advantage of being able to scale back resources. Um, sorry, it's unlikely to be able to gain from that advantage of scaling back resources, which can you know arguably make on-premises or, or private cloud or adoption a more uh, attractive option. And, and there's also, if we think about the economics, um, you know, as well as just, you know, we talked about licensing costs, we talked about uh, other uh, potential cost savings and, and, and costs, uh, sort of hidden costs to be taken into account. There is the fact that migrating, uh, you know, to workloads to the cloud uh, may not be a simple matter, particularly organizations with business intelligence and analytic workloads that involve uh, legacy or existing data models. Um, you know that are, but especially where those are distributed across multiple divisions within an organisation, that can be particularly challenging. So you know, often the move to a cloud, to to public or private cloud means can mean rearchitecting those data models, 
recalculating all the metrics involved, which obviously can be complex. And, and it you know, is a task that, that some companies are reluctant to undertake because of the cost, time and skills involved. And, and hence, you know, obviously, if you're talking about new workloads, new opportunities, new applications, new projects, where there is none, you know, none of the, those, those overheads, the, the path to databases and service adoption can be much smoother. So I mentioned earlier that um, you know, sort of we see that hybrid uh, cloud is, is, is absolutely sort of a reality, and particularly in, in relation to databases as a service uh, or database adoption. You know, what we see is you know, all companies pretty much other than brand new startups already have investments in, in databases deployed on premises. So it is inevitable that most enterprises will go through a phase of, of hybrid uh, databases uh, adoption um, uh, using both on-premises uh, and cloud databases. And, and what we see is that actually hybrid database cloud services um, are, are not just an inevitable phase of adoption, but actually have a role to play in accelerating the adoption of cloud database services over time. So database services uh, that, uh, that span on-premises and cloud have the potential to provide a consistent experience for database administrators and users. Um, as well as tools and managed services that will enable users to transition workloads to cloud databases um, as opposed to lifting and shifting the applications and the associated databases, uh, which can be co costly and complex. Um, this transition that we see of workloads from on-premises to cloud database uh, using hybrid database services will be enabled by a number of core technologies. Um, we see you know, the, the, the role to, to be played by database software that supports, supports elastic expansion and contraction, uh, as well as cloning, refreshing, and relocating databases from on-premises to the cloud. Uh, and also database management software that actually enables organizations to manage their, their database workloads both on premises and in the cloud, you know, effectively giving them, uh, you know, a single pane of glass uh, from which to work. So, uh, moving on, just to provide some, you know, some examples, as I said, from from the report based on um, organisations that, that we spoke to, um, to to get some idea of their experience of using database uh, uh, services. Um, the first one comes from uh, Zamil Industrial, uh, which is an organization based in Daman, Saudi Arabia, that develops materials and equipment uh, such as air conditioning uh, for use in the uh, construction industry. Um, it's a, a you know, fairly large organization employing over 11,000 people in, uh, in 55 countries, and it's in the process of moving its database workloads uh, to the cloud. So currently, um, it's about 80% of its database workloads were on premises and about 20% in the cloud today. They're, they're looking at 70, 30, changing that to 70, 30, or maybe even 60, 40, depending on how aggressively they move forward uh, next year. And, and in five years' time, perhaps actually then the cloud uh, databases will be in the majority. There's an anticipation that there's a potential to move to 60% you know, uh, in the cloud uh, but in five years and 40% on premises. And the reasons that, that they're doing that and anticipating that growth are based on the benefits that they've um, that they've seen from the you know that early stage of, of cloud database services adoption, which include things like uh, database consolidation advantages, cost savings, and operational efficiencies. Um, in particular. Um, the organization uh, you know, reported to us that they saw that maintenance, backup, and upgrades were far smoother and far simpler using database as a service uh, rather than you know, having to, to, to uh, do all the, the, those, that work themselves on on-premises environment. Uh, they identified cost savings, uh, in both in terms of licensing costs for the database software itself, also in terms of maintenance and upgrades of the previous on-premises databases. Um, and they actually estimated, as you can see here, 60 to 70% savings by moving uh, their, their Oracle databases from Oracle on-premises to the Oracle Database Cloud Service. Um, also, uh, the company identified uh, operational efficiencies in relation to databases as a service, specifically that developers could deploy applications without waiting for hardware to be provisioned. One of the things I you know, talked about right at the start uh, of the webinar um, they found uh, in, a, in, in their 
experience the transformation of data you know from on premises to that cloud was was straightforward there were no significant challenges that they'd seen at least at least so far and and it was far easier and faster to test new applications in the cloud uh, again in terms of you know the 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 the, um, the 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 time taken to actually get those workloads up and running and those databases configured uh, and therefore enable them to to test those applications and and move forward so of course the organization as we said you know about uh, you know just a, a minority of its database workloads today currently in the cloud environment um and and as is typical we saw that they started with less mission critical uh information um there were definitely for them security concerns uh in in the minds of both senior executives and and actually investors in the organization were were taking interest in what was happening in terms of the database as a service plan there were concerns about about security um but over time as i said or clearly the organization is increasing its use of databases as a service um um and they're now adding applications with more sensitive information um and they've done that based on running a review of the cloud of the you know the security capabilities of their cloud supplier and you know deciding as a company both the you know the the, the database administrators the senior executives the investors that so they are happy that the security that's available is you know as good if not better than than they they already have elsewhere um, and as you can see here, a quote from uh, Abhijit Wa, the ITG program manager uh, at Zamil, um, you know, just uh, really articulating that that you know there was a lot of questions from management and investors about moving that 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 sensitive business data to the cloud, and they had to show them that it was okay, and so they went out and did that, did the test themselves, proved it was the case, and now they can move forward in terms of taking more workloads into that cloud. And that's typical of, of, of what we see with many organizations that have done the same thing. Experiment initially, prove the potential value case, then you know trying to address some of the, the, the other potential uh, barriers, in particular obviously security in this case, through review and then, and then move forward from there. So the second um, organization uh, that, that we um, that we spoke to in terms of putting together this report is an organization called SolutionSoft. Uh, so they're based in Santa Clara, California, excuse me, and they provide automated software testing tools, uh, things like date and time testing tools, data storage, and also file transfer services. And they've got more than 2,000 customers and 50 employees, primarily involved in engineering. And um, the reason that those, you know, primarily those um, employees are involved in, in engineering is um, to do with the flagship product, which is called Time Machine, which provides customers with the ability to set up virtual clocks and time travel back and forward in time to allow for application testing um, and to conduct quality insurance testing during their software development. So obviously for uh, a solution software as an organization that's providing this as a service to its customers, when they're running that, you know, that on-premises with more than 2,000 customers doing application testing and quality assurance testing, there's a lot of overhead for the organization in terms of configuring the, you know, the, those test environments, running those test workloads, uh, and, you know, re and reporting back to their customers. Um, so the, the primary benefit for SolutionSoft in terms of uh, databases as a service uh, was in, in that flexibility and agility that they got for doing that, that development testing. Uh, specifically, um, they were able to replicate customer environments for conducting those testing scenarios without needing to build you know, all those complex racks and service systems, without that investment in on-premises hardware uh, and, of course, data center space and all the maintenance that goes along with that. Um, they were able to leverage the cloud to spin up uh, Oracle database instances for testing. Um, and at any given point, they're actually spinning up um, up to 50 separate instances running a mix of different applications and cores and, and, and able to therefore test you know, multiple workloads at any single given point without having to go through all that configuration overhead that we talked about. So currently 40% of its testing is done in the cloud, but again, you know, it's looking to, based on its experiences so far, looking to increase its investment in databases as a service. 
Um, moving to 100% is, is their aim over time, especially as the support for additional operating systems is added into their, their cloud environment. So they started with, with Oracle. They've obviously worked with other database uh, software and looking to expand that over time as the options are available to them. As I said, you know the, the main advantages they got was database as a service actually enables solutions have to improve its time to market, so it can release its software faster. It can do that work for its customers a lot faster than it could do uh, having to, to to deal with other all that on premises infrastructure. Um, database as a service also negates the need to rely on IT to maintain that on premises hardware. As we said, that results in lower administration costs. It reduces configuration overheads in terms of faster time for development, and it actually results in greater utilization of the of the resources that they have available. Um, some testing, obviously, as we said at this point, remains on premises, um, but they are introducing now a, a time machine management console, uh, which is uh, an application that enables that hybrid management. Some of those advantages that we talked about earlier in terms of managing database workloads both on premises and in the cloud uh, to enable them to get a you know a single view of all the environments that they're uh, that they're managing and testing. Finally, uh, Settle Our Estate uh, was the last organisation we spoke to. This is an online as asset management services provider. Um, they help people basically divide their assets amongst friends and family. Um, you know, fairly simple use case, but um, um, you know, also has you know significant data management requirements, uh, especially with 4,500 registered users. Um, the application itself was built using Oracle. Uh, application Express, and so obviously it makes sense to, to host that in Oracle Database Cloud. Uh, there's just one database instance at this point, but with two applications, an asset management, uh, the asset management application itself, and also an administrative console. Um, the organization found that there were databases and service provided significant time to mar market advantages. So they talked about being able to actually launch the product within 30 days of starting the development. You know, rather than still be trying to configure the associated hardware and uh, and everything else in terms of deploying uh, that that uh, application, um, database as a service they found also provided that inbuilt re resiliency, uh, creating two mirrors for the database held in different geographic regions with point in time recovery capabilities, and, and also it eased uh, administration um, of, and cost savings, um, actually saving on a full time database administrator. Um, and again, just a quote here for this time from the CEO, Ron Hardman of Settler Estate, uh, just highlighting the fact that they you know, went from, from, from start to launch in 30 days, and that just would not have been possible in, in his experience uh, doing that on premises. So finally, to, to conclude, um, you know, what we see is that database as a service adoption is still you know, relatively uh, early, but given the multiple benefits of moving to cloud in general and database as a service in particular, we definitely expect to see growing adoption of database services in the coming years. Uh, cost avoidance and cost savings uh, are obviously uh, primary, uh, sorry, primary drivers for greater adoption, but operational efficiency, reduced administration overheads, and faster time to development will also drive greater adoption uh, in the years to come. Um, enterprises of all sizes uh, are re recommended to begin evaluating databases as service offerings, as well as obviously evaluating the existing workloads to identify those suitable for migration to databases as service. Um, you know, there are clearly multiple barriers to adoption, uh, including security, data locality, regulatory considerations. Um, so while security concerns are abating over time, hybrid adoption models can act absolutely be expected to dominate in, in the short term. And we see that hybrid database services are not just an inevitable result of the existing reliance on databases deployed on premises, but also have the potential to serve as an on-ramp to increase databases as a service adoption over time. Um, Finally, uh, we see that, that enterprises should also begin evaluation of hybrid database management offerings that will enable them to manage both on-premises and cloud databases um, and uh, at the, you know, over time actually lower the barrier for transitioning workloads uh, to databases as a service. Uh, so with that, I thank you for your, your time. Um, I'm happy to take any questions in the, in the time we have remaining. Um, I'll hand you back to, to Rosanna to, uh, to handle those. Thanks, Matt. We just got a question in. 
how to implement security controls for databases in the cloud. Uh, well, I think you know, that, that to some extent it depends on the cloud provider, it depends on the database. Obviously most uh, you know, databases um, come with inbuilt security capabilities um, and so you know one thing to review is that what you get on premises is absolutely the same as you get in the in the cloud and that you can implement those also how you can integrate those database uh, sorry those security capabilities with you know the broader security capabilities um, in terms of um, uh, you know identifying users coming through that cloud environment ensuring they have the, the right qualifications credentials to be using that service um, and um, you know, obviously, there are you know d database security offerings as well that that are available in the cloud that you can run alongside your database services. So there are multiple approaches, um, and it is, and that's why I talked about sort of evaluating those capabilities. Um, you know, to some extent, it's it's a matter of uh, for organisations looking at the the. the the level of security they get from the existing databases on premises, and comparing that, if you you know the same database are running as a service in the cloud, do they get the same security? You know the same boxes ticked, and and also as we said, a little bit also of what happens should something go wrong, um, and, and making sure those boxes are ticked. So it, it kind of depends on on the individual database and, and cloud, but. Um, the first thing is to re basically review that service as you would review, you know, any uh, potential on-premises database, new database software supplier, you know, to compare their, their, their security capabilities with, with what you already have. Great. Thank you. I don't know if we have any extra time to answer one more, but um, real quick if we could. What about big data in the cloud? Are the adoption trends any different? Um, they're a little bit different, um, given that, you know, as I talked about, obviously, it's, if you're talking about new workloads, new applications, new projects, it, it obviously eases uh, the potential adoption of cloud uh, services. And we certainly see um, that, you know, as a, as a proportion of, of the existing big data workloads, uh, a, a larger proportion of those are in the cloud today, you know, given that, that there isn't that existing uh, uh, high level of investment or on-premises workloads. So there's definitely, you know, uh, a faster uh, adoption of, of bit, I'd say, you know, big data in, in the cloud. And actually, we anticipate that that will continue. I think one of the things in relation to big data is, you know, do you as an organization have the skills in-house to actually configure and manage and run a, for example, a Hadoop cluster environment? And if you don't, then, you know, obviously it's increasingly attractive to, to look at a cloud provider that, that can configure and manage and run all that for you, and you can just concentrate on, on actually doing the, you know, the front-end analysis of data in that environment. So that's a little bit different from database in that, obviously, a lot more organizations have the skills in-house already to actually configure and manage the, the relational database workloads. Great. Thanks, Matt. I believe that is all the time we have today. I know that there is another question in the queue here, but I will be sure to respond to it offline after the webinar. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today, and thank you, Matt, for presenting. Have a great day. Thank you.